Good morning, church. Good to see you this morning on uh, this crisp, frosty morning. Uh, but we have come to warm ourselves uh, in nearness of, of the Lord and in nearness of His Spirit as we gather together uh, in His name. And uh, today, uh, hopefully, uh, you've, you've got a, a communion cup. We'll gather around the Lord's table. Uh, if you haven't uh, got a communion cup, you can just signal to one of the greeters and the, the greeters can bring one over to you. Uh, but we'll gather around the Lord's table at the end of, the, at the end of today's service. Uh, but we'll also have uh, a time of remembrance and time of, ref of reflection uh, in uh, our prayers to the people today as we mark this day uh, of remembrance this week on the 11th day of the 11th month of the 11th hour as we reflect on those past, those present, and those who are preparing to serve our country. Today's call to worship is very much connected and in tune with Nehemiah chapter 5, where we'll be in God's Word uh, at the center of our service. Uh, but today we look at Psalm 146, and we look at these verses of the psalmist that reminds us to keep our, our eyes open to those in need around us. And so hear these verses from Psalm 146, where the Lord and the psalmist reminds us to keep our eyes open. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind the Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. The Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and widows, but he frustrates the plans of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. He will be your God, O Jerusalem, throughout the generations. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together, church, as we come to worship the living Lord. Father, we thank you for your love. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your forgiveness. 
and gather around your table of forgiveness today. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence and your comfort. Father, Son, and Spirit, we have come to worship you. We have come because you have greeted us each and every day of our lives. And since we last met, you have been at work and active. Lord God, we, we come to you today in remembrance and reflection, not only of, of those who have served, but we remember our Lord as he calls us around his table. Lord God, we have come with hearts of thanksgiving, hearts of joy. Just as the psalmist reminds us today, some of us come weighed down. Some of us come in need of healing and eyes opened. And you, Lord, continue to reveal your goodness and your grace to us each and every day. And so we have come to lift up our hands, lift up our hearts, lift up our voices to you. Because you, Lord, are the beginning and end of all things and the beginning and end of us. So, Lord, gather us in one heart and one mind and one body and one voice. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our first song of praise, In Christ Alone. Since curse has lost it. 
its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of and ever pluck me from his hand till he returns and calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand At Calvary, we've come to worship and give praise to God and give him thanks. Years I spent in vanity and pride. Let's sing at Calvary. spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died. sin I learned, then I trembled at the law I'd spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied for me, there my burden so found liberty. everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. salvation's plan Oh, the grace that brought it down to man Oh, the mighty God that God this man and Calvary Mercy there was great and grace was free Pardon there was multiplied to me There my burden was so found Now, from your seats, you can say hello, neighbor, to a neighbor nearby you as you're greeting each other this morning. And as the kids are going to be heading to their program this morning, then you can be seated. Our young people are headed over to learn about, you know, it might sound chilly at this time of year, but how to walk on water. 
And so we'll uh, be praying for them as they learn about Jesus and teaching Peter and his disciples about trusting in him. Um, just a few announcements, church. Uh, some of you were with us last Sunday or were watching online. Uh, we continue to have uh, caution tape in the fellowship hall. Uh, so we're asking people just to observe that caution and not go to the far end of the fellowship hall at this time. Uh, we're continuing to uh, get some assessment on how uh, to uh, kind of temporarily, at least through the winter months, uh, protect that area uh, and not cause any more further damage than uh, has already been uh, done uh, and so that uh, it can be addressed uh, in due time. Um, also, uh, a new announcement. Uh, I had opportunity this week to uh, meet with uh, Constable Sonia Upshaw from our local detachment here in Chester. Um, and she is a community liaison with our, with our community, uh, with kind of specializing in senior safety and particular around scams. Uh, you know, we hear of the frequency of how uh, either these phone calls or these emails uh, can, um, can cause uh, seniors to have trust in the voice over the phone or the, the officialness of the, of the email. Uh, and she wants to help protect people in our neighborhood from, uh, from theft uh, and from taking, uh, taking advantage of the most vulnerable in our, in our neighborhood. Um, and so uh, if you are interested in joining a little workshop, we don't have a date or a time yet to, uh, to be determined, uh, but we're just seeing if there is general interest uh, in our congregations and in our neighborhood uh, for, for people just to be equipped uh, to know how to, how to answer or know what to do or uh, know how to report things uh, when those things arise. So there's a little sign-up sheet on that back table as you're leaving. Um, and if you'd like to join us uh, in a workshop at a future time and a future venue, uh, we'd, uh, we'd like to know if there's interest in that. Uh, you'll also notice at the back uh, there's a huge banner uh, that has taken a lot of work and effort uh, by a small group of people um, and uh, we're grateful for Natalie uh, to uh, bring us together around this. Uh, the, this list of names, uh, some of them will be familiar because they're names that are over here uh, on the, the roll of honor uh, in our church family, but all of these names are from uh, various different organizations in our community, uh, and all of those names are people from Chester Basin who have served in different, uh, at different times, uh, in different conflicts, uh, and uh, we've been able to uh, not only start this list, I'm going to say start because we're looking for some help. Uh, there's a number of names on this, uh, this comprehensive list uh, that have just initials, uh, and so we're looking for kind of full names uh, that we know that there are some people uh, who served in, in different times and different seasons uh, that didn't consider themselves a veteran and didn't consider what they did as service. Uh, and so there, there may be names that we're missing uh, on that list as well. Uh, so we're looking for accuracy, we're looking to correct mistakes, uh, this is a work in progress and uh, we're, just, uh, we're just trying to kind of help uh, provide educational opportunities about people of service, women and men uh, in our own neighborhood uh, from times past to times present. Uh, so uh, have a look at that, that list and it'll, it'll It'll have a, we'll have an opportunity to share this. It was at Grace Anglican this morning uh, to share with them. Uh, our intention is to share it with Forest Heights uh, as they have their own uh, service of remembrance as well uh, and to also be there on uh, Remembrance Day of this week, which, as I said last week, will be online. Um, and so if you want to, uh, to join us online, uh, it will be uh, broadcast through the Legion's Facebook page. Um, and if, uh, if you uh, uh, want, as so many of us want to do, uh, to uh, drop our poppies uh, at the Cenotaph, uh, we're just asking that you come and do that maybe later in the day. Uh, the whole afternoon would be uh, an appropriate time to just come, pay your respects, uh, have that moment of reflection as you drop your poppy at that time.
rather than in the morning, because uh, we'll just be uh, invited guests only. Uh, what else is new? The worship team and praise teams are starting to gear up. And if you are interested in uh, participating in a praise team uh, to help lead in Sunday morning, we're eager to have you uh, to join us. Uh, if you want to, uh, to form a praise team, please uh, just contact me either through the phone uh, or email uh, or after the service. Uh, we'd, we'd appreciate knowing how many teams and how we can start to form a schedule and a roster, so to speak. Um, last but not least, you'll start to see on our uh, Facebook page uh, in our social media, and we'll start to promo this uh, in the next few weeks, there are going to be two opportunities to partner with Canadian Baptist Ministries over the Advent and Christmas season. And uh, one of them is to be um, helping um, with uh, young women and, uh, and, and girls uh, who are uh, in India uh, and helping them through our partners of CBM. And the other is uh, as we approach the manger this Christmas, uh, we're thinking about filling a stable. Um, and so CBM, through their giving and hopeful gifts at Christmas time, also provide um, a, a stable of livestock uh, for a family or fam a network of families. Uh, and we'll have more information about that. Uh, but for now, um, just keep your ears and eyes open for those uh, those ways to give. And we'll we'll there will be specific things to put on your tithing envelope or in your e-transfer. Um, if, if that's the way you would uh, like to give. And there will also be a special website uh, that we'll be sharing um, that will help direct people to the, uh, the campaign with India in particular. I believe that is all of the announcements. If there are more, I humbly have forgotten them. So uh, we will uh, we'll let you know if there's anything else uh, f through social media and our website. We want to give thanks. Uh, to the Lord for offerings and tithes given this day and throughout the week, and uh, we want to give thanks to Him uh, from whom all blessings flow. So let's pray together as we give thanks for these tithes and offerings today. Father God, You are good and generous and filled with Your grace each and every day of our lives, and we, we thank You, Lord, for Your provision that you continue to provide through your people for the ministries of this church. And Lord, we simply ask that we would be faithful stewards of the resources you have given. We give you thanks and we have given joyfully and with thanksgiving to you because your mercies know no end. Lord, you have been faithful and steadfast in your love. And so, Lord, we, we do give thanks for the material resources that we receive, food on our tables and in our cupboards, warmth at this time of year in our homes, and a roof over our head. And, Lord, we give thanks for the unseen or untold ways that you provide for us with your peace, with your strength, and with your deep and enduring love for us. And so, Lord, we, we return to you a portion with thanksgiving in our hearts to you. Lord, help us, give us wisdom, and may we always be aligned with you and your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to the Word of the Lord. We'll be in Nehemiah chapter 5. Don't worry. You're not, don't be confused. We were in chapter 6 last week. We were just stepping back a chapter and looking at Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. So hear the Word of the Lord, or read along with, and may its reading be a blessing. Now, there was a great outcry of the people 
and of their wives against their Jewish kin. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, we must get grain so that we may eat and stay alive. There were also those who said, We are having to pledge our fields, our vineyards, and our houses in order to get grain during the famine. And there were those who said, We are having to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay the king's tax. Now our flesh is the same as that of our kindred. Our children are the same as their children. And yet we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been ravished. We are powerless, and our fields and vineyards now belong to others. Nehemiah said, I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these complaints. After thinking it over, I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are taking interest from your own people. And so I called a great assembly to deal with them and said to them, as far as we are able... We have bought back our Jewish kindred who had been sold to other nations, but now you are selling your own kin who must then be bought back by us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. And so I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of God? to prevent the taunts of the nations of our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us stop this taking of interest. Restore to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, their houses, and the interest on money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been extracting from them. And then they said, We will restore everything and demand nothing more from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them take an oath to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out everyone from from house and from property who does not perform this promise. Thus may they be shaken and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, I want to take a moment of remembrance and that we would do this together. Prayers of thanksgiving to the Lord, prayers of confession to Him, prayers of action on our behalf. So let us stand together. And as we stand and take a moment of silence, you may reflect on a family member, a friend, a neighbor, someone who has served either past or is currently serving or is in the midst of of learning how to serve. As you reflect on them, as you bring them to heart and to mind, we can give thanks to God for them. Let us pray.
O Lord our God, the God who sees, the God who hears, the God who sent his only begotten Son, the God who has given us the gift of his Spirit. Father and Son and Spirit, we give you thanks. We come to you with hearts of thanksgiving for each of those we have brought to mind and brought to heart today. We thank you for their lives, for their impact on us and their service to us. We thank you that you know them and love them as you love us. Oh God, we confess that in times past, in times present, we have been afraid. We have been indecisive when other lives have threatened, have been threatened. We've been too concerned maybe with politics and precedent. And other, other times, Lord, we have been quick to jump in, assured of our own righteousness, assured of our own justness in our cause. We have too often prayed to you for support of maybe our own prejudice and our own goals. Forgive us and give us courage to seek peace and justice in your world, wherever you may lead us. Today, Lord, O oh Lord of hosts, Lord God, we call, who calls us to be engaged in the world, we pray for those who are serving in our armed forces, soldiers, sailors, air personnel, and those who provide support for them. We pray for those who care for those who fight, for mental health, nurses, doctors, and chaplains. We pray for those who put themselves in harm's way, for those engaged in mine clearing, search and rescue, for those in the air and in the high seas. Lord, keep them safe in their tasks. Keep them virtuous in their calling. Preserve them from danger and return them to the those who love them most. Lord, we offer to you our prayers for those who seek justice and resist evil. We pray for those who need your presence and strength to stand firm, for those who are opposed to the use of violence in any form in faithful response to the Prince of Peace. We pray for those who speak the unpopular truths, who protect the unpopular victims, who choose the unpopular path of peace. O oh God, of every human being, forgive when we identify our kin too easily as enemies. Teach us to seek the good in all, and not only our own. When our cousins are acting unjustly or causing harm, help us to constrain them without hatred or evil, but to seek their good, even as we resist the damage they may cause. We pray that those to whom we are opposed may be turned from enemy to friend. We pray that in our cause we may not fall into sin, so convinced of our own righteousness that we are unaware of our own sin. We pray that we may not be distracted by another sin, that we cannot be convinced of their value as children of God. May we always remember your willingness to forgive, to bless, and to call the most unlikely your beloved. Lord, help us. You are the God of ages past. You are the hope for years to come. 
Lord, continue to call us to yourselves, to be faithful to you and you alone. Lord, we ask that you would just continue to bless and keep this neighborhood, your people, this country, today, tomorrow, that we might be forever yours. Lord, we pray this all in the powerful and wonderful name of Jesus. In the Prince of Peace, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Let's return to prayer just briefly as we approach the Word of God today. Let's pray together. Lord, as the psalmist reminds us and encourages us, we ask that as we approach your Word and your Scripture today, that the meditations of our hearts and our minds would be acceptable and that we would be aligned with you and your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, today we conclude a a bit of a, a three-part series. Uh, you may have been following along in this, that there's been this kind of cycle in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and this is the end of this third cycle, um, where people have returned, there's been a wave of returnees, and then there's been opposition to whatever the Lord has been calling them to do, and they have had to learn to persevere in the midst of that opposition. We heard that in Zerubbabel and Yeshua when they first came back, and they were uh, in charge of and entrusted with building the temple uh, and reestablishing worship in the, amongst these people. We heard it again in Ezra as he was centering them around the Word of God, of how that is a life-giving Word for them to refocus and to reestablish their identity in this rebuilding and revival project. And here, as we have been walking through these first seven chapters of Nehemiah, have been focused on uh, not just walls and construction of walls, but really of community, of being the worshiping people of God, and the sense of working in the common good. Before we, in the next two weeks, kind of land this airship, so to speak, and we get to the conclusions, concluding chapters of Nehemiah, we're going to step back into chapter 5, just briefly. Another, if, we've, if we thought that there were points in Ezra, uh, you know, that we were scratching our heads about how does this fit, this may be one of those chapters uh, as we conclude this third cycle before we get to the conclusion. As I was reading through uh, this chapter this week uh, and thinking about its, its deep theological uh, uh, reflection on who we are as humans, um, I was drawn to, and, and probably because Remembrance Day is this week, drawn to uh, a battle, a battle of the Atlantic. Um, I, uh, my niece, Anna, who's over next door, said uh, so boldly the other night that you learn something every day, and I felt like I was learning things as I was walking through learning about the Battle of the Atlantic, a naval campaign, one of the longest, if not the longest, in the Second World War. The convoys of ships that left the eastern seaboard, headed for uh, destinations in Europe, they carried essential supplies. They were not just essential applies for a war effort, but also for civilian needs. Survival in those places for troops and soldiers, uh, but also for uh, the, the cupboards of many people throughout Europe. Survival depended on these boats and these ships making it safe to shore and making that cross-Atlantic voyage. Travel at sea as some of you know, can be difficult at the best of times. Weather and waves are hard to navigate. 
myself, uh, as I have been able to be on the, on the ocean, even in familiar waters, rely on charts, charts to help see things that I can't see from the, the deck of a boat, shoals, reefs, those things that lurk under the water. But in this campaign, the Battle of the Atlantic, it wasn't just geology that lurked under the surface. The use of submarines in the Second World War and through the Battle of the Atlantic was a, a big shift in tactics. I, I learned this week that solo submarines in prior years, prior to the Second World War, would just linger and lurk around a port just by themselves and, and might be strategic in how they use their force. But in the Second World War, during the Battle of the Atlantic, whole divisions of submarines would form together and they would pick off multiple ships. I learned that sonar, which helped them see, but actually was a way of hearing, hadn't really developed fast enough to catch all of what lurked beneath the surface. On the deck of a ship, a journey to the naked eye could look well and straightforward, maybe easy, but from the naked eye, what we can't see, what lurks below the surface, could be very deadly. I contemplated this Battle of the Atlantic and the use of submarines as I tried to make sense of what chapter 5 is telling us. As I was reading, I was comforted uh, through the, the many different uh, scholars and professors that I was reading this week who are more educated than me, who also were left with heads scratching. Why is chapter 5 in the midst of all of these other stories, of all this other um, talk of the working for the common good and opposing this external opposition. What does this have to say about God's people? And maybe what does it say about us? Maybe in chapter 5, like in Ezra chapter 9, if you remember when we were walking through the end of that book, it might be exposing that under the surface there is a brokenness in humanity that needs healing. That we hear and have heard that Nehemiah is angry at what he sees, at the injustice of what is happening. On the surface, working for the common good and seeing walls being constructed and temples being raised would be something that they would be proud of, something that they would want to signal and flag as progress. But under the surface, Nehemiah is angry. We heard the issues that are present with these people at that time. People are hungry. People are selling their fields, selling their resources, borrowing money, being held at exorbitant interest to pay their taxes. And they're so desperate, helpless, and poor that they do the most desperate of things like selling their children into bondage. It's obvious, and Nehemiah can see plainly that these people have forgotten the law, the Torah. For some of us who were reading through the book of Exodus, Exodus 22 reminds the people and reminded Nehemiah of how to care for the widow, the stranger, the orphan, and to care for each other. These people, their behavior is like of a pawnbroker, not a family member. I was reminded this week, even as they were the chapters that precede and, and come after the chapter 5 speak of this project of the wall, I was reminded that you can't eat walls. And the injustice that Nehemiah is angry about is something that may and should anger us. 
chapter 5 may, as if, you, if you've been reading through this book of the Bible with us, may come out of left field. But it does speak to a human tendency. And it should give us caution in times of our own revival and rebuilding. That if we're completely focused on the external, whether it be opposition, or if we're completely uh, focused on projects, we might neglect the core of our identity as God's people. This has proven itself throughout Scripture. And just to name but a few times, we might remember, uh, because Nehemiah was probably reminding himself of the Red Sea, of crossing and being rescued from slavery, only to quickly get to the other side and create a golden calf. King David, when he united the northern and southern kingdoms and ascended to the throne in a time of what could have been abundance and in a time where there might have been great celebration, we also see the under the surface what lurked as he desired Bathsheba. In the New Testament, we know that 12 come and walk with Jesus, learn from him, get in relationship with him in deep and intimate ways, and yet there is a thief, a denier amongst them, two brothers who are power hungry. There are things that lurk beneath the surface that expose our brokenness, a human tendency towards sin. Reminders to me that despite our human tendencies, that we continue to miss that mark that God calls us to seek in Him. I'm thankful. If you heard in verse 13 of our passage today, as Nehemiah kind of ceremonially empties his pocket, unfolds it to say, may those who perpetuate this injustice be shaken out by God. That the Jesus I know, rather than shaking me out of his pocket and leaving me behind, reminds me that the Father is like someone who waits at the end of the road, looking, waiting, watching for that lost son to return. Don't get me wrong, God doesn't like sin, does not seek us to miss the mark, but is persistent in his call to return to him, to her, return to his ways to return to life-giving roads. Chapter 5 may highlight and contain for us a need for our commitment to God, for a commitment to a deeper relationship with Him and with His Son and with the Spirit. A deeper transformation is required and challenges us to see areas in our own lives as we look inward at what's lurking below and beneath. Challenges us to see areas of our own lives that need renewal and reform, the brokenness within us. That we may be like Ezra and Nehemiah have, have rested on, that we might be Jeremiah and Ezekiel-like people that God can transform hearts and give us a new heart of flesh, not of stone. That as we have his word being written on our hearts, this transformation transforms our lives. That from sin, Jesus offers forgiveness. What may be clear to us 
on this side of the cross that is not clear to them in Nehemiah's time is that salvation won't come from projects, won't come from walls, won't come from temples or altars. Salvation doesn't come from any of those. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. And our heart surgeon, our heart surgeon, as the scripture tells us, is a potter is someone who wants to mold and shape us from the inward to the outward. Our heart surgeon is a gardener who seeks to grow new life in us and grow new things as we abide in him. Our heart surgeon is a shepherd who wants to guide us on life-giving paths. Our heart surgeon is a savior who died for us and rose again so that we might die and rise in him. Salvation comes from the Lord. Salvation, wholeness, completeness is what he seeks for you. What he seeks in the revival and rebuilding of us, his church today. Jesus is our Savior. As we gather around this table today, as we remember him and remember his sacrifice for us, the forgiveness he offers us for the new life that he's called us to, let's give thanks to the Lord for he is and will always be good. Let's pray together. Lord, we all have things that are lurking beneath the surface. Sin, ways in which our hearts and our minds are still missing your mark. Lord, help us. Lord, Jesus, you have said that you are the light of the world. And we know that your perfect light will expose those things in us that you seek to transform. That you, Lord Jesus, are the true vine. And that you have called us to abide, to remain, to be forever attached to you in your life-giving source. Lord, we ask that as you continue to be the potter, on our hearts and our minds, as you continue to be the gardener of our lives, the shepherd who leads us, the Savior who died for us. Lord, in your grace, in your mercy, in your love for us, may we continue to give over ourselves to you in trust, in confidence, in faith that the work you have started you will see to completion. Lord, be with us, your disciples, your followers, those who seek to walk and step with you. Be with us. Guide and direct us, we pray. And through the power of your Spirit, transform us today. Lord, we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to gather around the Lord's table. So let us, as Doug gets in tune, let us take a moment to get our hearts in tune as we come and approach his table and approach the Lord today.
we come to the table simply because the Lord invited you here. The Lord prepared a table for you. He provided a place for you to sit at it. And Jesus says to you, as he has said so often through so many people in so many ways, he says, simply come. Come if you are heavy and heavy laden. Come if you have just cast down your nets. Come if you're in need of of a physician. Because the Lord seeks to heal and to save. You're welcome to come if you've known the Lord a long time. And have felt that invitation for many years. You can come if you have only just heard him. And you're just getting curious about who he is. And what he can do in your life. You can come if you're well established or just making a step today. You can come because he's called you to come and you're welcome there. We come today to remember him. We do this out of obedience because he asked us to remember him in this way. And for 2,000 years, sisters and brothers like yourself have come to a table, have come to bread and to cup to remember the Lord, great things he has done. And so we come today in that rich history like our sisters and brothers before and our sisters and brothers after to proclaim Jesus as Lord master of our hearts king of our lives we come today like he came into that upper room with his friends his disciples People, he said, no longer do I call you servants, I call you friends. We come with that same invitation that he gave that evening. We come knowing that on the night he was betrayed, that same and very night that he was handed over to people who would have him killed, he washed those feet of those disciples. That's who he is. The suffering servant. The prince of peace. We come to remember the words he spoke that night. That night where he took bread. He took it and he blessed it. He broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body broken for you. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Let's give thanks for Jesus and his his body broken for us, for the cross and his sacrifice upon it, the sacrifice of love that he extends today. Let's give thanks to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you that as we view the cross, as we remember you, as we remember your broken body, that you don't seek to keep us broken, but to seek to heal. And so, Lord, we give you thanks today for the healing that has happened amongst us, the wholeness that you have called us to, that you, Lord, you, Lord, are a healer in our lives. Lord, continue to be the king of our hearts. And Lord, continue to 
remind us of your love for us, especially through your broken body now. We pray this all in your powerful name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of him. In an evening of invitation, in an evening where it was a, a supper of invitation, Jesus also invited them to take a cup. He offered a cup to them, and he offers a cup to you. He said to them, and he says to us, take this cup, a cup of new covenant, new promises of new life that's found in him. A cup that offers forgiveness, forgiveness of sins, that he can transform sin into salvation with his precious blood. Let's give thanks for the cup of Christ, cup of the new covenant, cup of forgiveness that he offers us today. Let's pray together. Lord, we, we thank you. We are humbled humbled, Lord, that you extend this cup to us. That you offer this cup to us who have missed the mark and who seek to be renewed in your forgiveness, to be transformed in your likeness. Lord, we give you thanks for your grace and your mercy as you extend this cup of new covenant to us. We give you thanks that it reminds us of you, of your goodness, of your forgiveness, and of your love. Lord, may we always be reminded of your love for us. And as we drink of this cup today, Lord, may it remind us of your sacrifice, but of your love. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. He said, take this cup and drink. Do this in remembrance of him. The scriptures tell us that as often as we eat and drink in this way, just as our sisters and brothers have done for years and years upon years, we are doing two things. We are saying to each other and to the world around us that Jesus is Lord. And we're also being reminded as we eat and drink this way that we too also have eyes on the horizon, an ear to a trumpet sound. That as often as we eat and drink this way, we anticipate the Lord's return. The scriptures also tell us that as they left for the Mount of Olives, they sang a hymn together to bring comfort to them as they walked into the darkness. Let's sing together, Near the Cross.
As we leave, um, I've got a few text messages this week uh, because, as you probably heard on Friday, a lot of uh, the more recent cases that we've seen in our in our province ha- have been around churches and church related. And we don't come today to worship in fear; we come to worship in love and to worship as Christ's people today. But let's also remind ourselves that. Just as we came in with our masks on to protect and to love one another, we're going to wear them on the way out. That just as we've given each other some space and some distance this morning, we're going to do that on the way out. Because this is an act of, a simple act of love we can do for each other. And so as we depart this place, as we depart this time of worship today, let us know that we go in faith, we go in hope, we go in Christ and especially in his love for you and for me and for our neighborhood. And so let us go in the name of Christ, bearing his name today and forever. Amen. God bless you all.